get to deal with me today. Uh, and he likes to do themes on Sunday morning, so I had, you know, asked him what his theme, upcoming theme, was going to be. And so he said it was going to be ins insignificant how little things matter. And my first reaction was, okay, it's, you know, I wasn't thinking really clearly because obviously everything in the Bible <laughs> talks about little things and how little things are important. And as a short guy, I really do appreciate that. Um, but we're going to be in John chapter number 6, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13. And while you turn that direction, obviously we're talking about little things and how they matter. And, you know, we obviously know this is true. If you've ever been to a restaurant, and you look down into your sandwich, and there's a tiny little hair there. It matters, right? It's, it's disgusting, you know. And, and little things, uh, they do matter. And throughout the Bible, we see lesson after lesson explaining how the little things are important. Um, in today's passage, it's a very familiar passage, uh, we're going to see how Jesus used some little things and how important it was. It's an awesome story, uh, but as we read the passage today and as we talk about it, you know, I encourage you to think of it with new eyes, you know, kind of view this uh, through new eyes like, you, you know, I know it's a familiar story, you've heard it your entire life, uh, and, and it's easy when we know these stories, when we, we kind of get complacent with it and we kind of just, you know, go through the motions. But really think about uh, what was going on that day. You know, the feeding of the 5,000 is, you know, one of the only two, one of two miracles that were in all four Gospels. The other one obviously being the resurrection of Jesus. But uh, this is one of the g miracles that is in all four Gospels. And I, and I would encourage you to read through all four versions of it, they all have a little bit of a different take on it, and they all have a little bit different uh, perspective, as we know, uh, as the writer of the Gospels, we're all different. But we're going to spend our time in John, and we're going to refer um, back to Mark uh, uh, quite a bit, too, um, because, you know, they, there's, there's, like I said, a little bit of different on what's going on. So just a little context before we actually read uh, the, the verses here. Uh, the Gospel of Mark gives us a little bit more context uh, of what had happened just preceding this. But Jesus had just had the disciples pair up in pairs and two by two they were to go out and they were to go and to preach and to teach and to heal. And they were to do all the cast out demons and they were about to go, you know, do some, do the Lord's work. Uh, they hadn't been in ministry very long at this point. They hadn't gone to seminary, certainly. Uh, they didn't know everything that they needed to know, but Jesus sent them out and told them, get to work. And we have that same instruction as well, and it's kind of a, a little side note there. But they had just got back from that. They had gone out. The Bible doesn't say exactly how long they had gone, but they had gone out. They had done this thing. But part of the instructions that Jesus had given them too was to not take anything with them. Leave the suitcase at home. Don't take your purse with money in it. Don't take extra clothes. Don't even take two coats. Wherever you go, the people there will, will take care of you. And I don't know about you, but that would be difficult for me. You know, we went to Florida for a week a couple weeks ago, and you couldn't hardly breathe once we got everything loaded up in, in our vehicle. There was so much stuff in there. Uh, but the disciples, they were given this instruction, and Jesus told them, don't take anything with you. Uh, be prepared, go and preach and teach. And so they had just got back to Jesus. They were telling him about what had happened, how exciting everything had been, what they had seen, what they had done, who they had talked to, uh, the miracles and the various different things. And there were so many people around coming and going. The Bible says that they didn't even have time to eat. So Jesus says, all right, let's go. We're going to go off to a desert here. We're going to go off to a side place. And we'll have a little bit of a time of rest. We'll get away from the crowd. And, and we will uh, have a little bit of time of rest. But let's go ahead and we'll read chapter, John chapter 6. We'll read verses uh, 1 through 13. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, 
When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten." Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given to us to come to your house, to open your word, to uh, hear the message that you've prepared for us, Lord. Just pray that uh, you would give each and every one of us the ears to hear what you would have, Lord, and that we would be open to your leading and to your guidance. Just pray that you would give me the words that you would have for me to say, Lord. I thank you for all you've given us, and I ask all these things in your name. Amen. So the little things we're talking about, obviously, are the five little barley loaves and the two small fish. Seemingly small items that a uh, lad, a boy, had packed for his own lunch for that day. Um, and, and we're going to talk about those certainly, but let's start back there at the beginning where Jesus sits down with the disciples and a great company is coming towards him. So he sits down, and in, in Mark and in other gospel passages, it kind of gives the indication that they had done so much stuff, the people weren't letting them get away, right? They were following them. He was in a boat, so evidently they were running along the sand, watching the boat as they went, and they were going to where he was going, because they wanted to see and hear and you know, we, we find out later after this passage that maybe not all of them had great intentions. You know, they wanted Jesus to be the next ruler and the, to save them from the Roman Empire. And that wasn't Jesus' purpose. But they were very interested in what was going on. So this great multitude, it says 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, that were following Jesus. And Jesus sees them. And that's our first point. The Lord's vision. He sees things differently than we see things. Right? Um, once again, from the Gospel of Mark, it says that when Jesus saw them, he had compassion towards them as they were sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, the passage says. And then we also know from the book of 1 Samuel, uh, when, when, Jesus is, or when uh, God has sent Samuel to find a king, he tells him, he's like, don't look on the outward appearance, because the Lord seeth not as, the man, as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So Jesus saw this multitude of people that wanted to get close to him, that wanted to see the extravaganza of miracles and everything, excitement that was going on in his life. But he saw people in need of a Savior. He saw people in need of some leadership. What did the disciples see? He saw some people that needed some food, right? Kind of the way we think, right? When we see, you know, a house full of people come over, we're going, okay, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> Where are we going to order the pizza from? You know, how much money is this going to cost? And that's kind of what, the way the disciples were thinking. They saw a bunch of people that needed to eat. Philip was from that area around there where they were at. And so Jesus says to Philip, Philip, where's the nearest Chick-fil-A at? Right? Which, by the way, yesterday was my anniversary as well, only 17 years but um, we went to Chick-fil-A for our anniversary dinner because that just seems to be, you know, the right thing to do. But he says to Philip, he, he's testing Philip, right? Remember the context of where Philip had just come from. He had gone out and he was teaching and preaching. He, for those, that period of time, whatever it was, uh, he had been totally dependent on God for care and for the people around him, the God's people to give him food, give him a place to sleep. And so Jesus said, I wonder if Philip's learned anything. Now, John 
says, yeah, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He just wanted to see what Philip had to say. So he asks Philip, you're from around here. Where can we, where's the nearest place so we can get some bread? And uh, Philip didn't really seem to uh, have a great answer for, for Jesus here. Um, in Philip's defense, he was probably hangry too, you know, how we all get when we haven't eaten. We kind of get that little touch of hunger and anger mixed together. And, and that hanger there that Philip was experiencing, he's like, look, 200 penny worth isn't going to even give everybody a little bit. Now, 200 penny worth, I looked it up and, you know, you, you can't believe anything you read on the internet, right? But you have anywhere from $10,000 to $20,000 in, Ameri- you know, in, in, our, in our dollar system, uh, different people say, uh, approximately eight months for a common person back there. So a common man's wages back then, it would have been about eight months worth of money, right? So you get the point, a lot of money. He's like, even if I had my ATM card with me and we could go get the money out of the bank, eight months worth of wages, they're not even gonna get a little bit each. And so that brings us to our next point. The Lord had a plan, right? The Lord had a vision of the people and he also had a plan for what he was gonna do next. And Andrew speaks up at this point. What's he say? He's like, well, there is this kid here. He's got a couple fish and five loaves. And had he left it there, we would have thought, wow, Andrew's got a lot of faith, right? He, and he knows there's something there, and he knows God, Jesus can do what, what, what needs to be done. But he finishes that statement with, yeah, but amongst all these people, what is that little bit of food? That's not going to, uh, that's not going to suffice. And, and that's, you know, something that we often uh, have to deal with in our own life here as well. We often think that we don't have what it takes. We don't have enough. Uh, Whatever it may be, as a parent, as a spouse, as a teacher, as someone standing up here today, you know, we don't always think that we have enough. And the truth be told, we don't have enough on our own power, right? But the disciples weren't alone that day, were they? They had Jesus standing there with them. And the Lord had a plan. So he tells his disciples, all right, sit everybody down on the grass. Now, when we go into Mark, once again, he gives a little bit more explanation. He sat people down in teams of 50 and 100 and has them all sit down. And, you know, so probably in families and in villages and, you know, because all these people that had followed. So he sits them down in little groups. And it's a short little passage here. But think about that. You know, the Coliseum or the U.S. Bank Arena downtown holds like 17,000 people, right? So probably somewhere in that neighborhood of people that were there that day, 5,000 men or men. Uh, so when you get wives and women and children, you know, probably somewhere around there. Going around and going, okay, you guys are in one family. Can, can you just sit here? Yeah, what are we doing? Just Jesus wants you to sit down. Hold on. And then you go over here and you, and you tell them, and they go, well, we're going to get something to eat? You know, they're probably, they've been all day listening to Jesus teach. So they're getting hungry. And they're like, okay, he's sitting us down. Maybe there's food. Didn't see the food truck pull up. Certainly no one carrying enough baskets full of food. So, you know, it's going around the crowd, I'm sure. They're going, okay, we're sitting down. They're getting us ready for a meal, but I don't see anything. What's going on? And, you know, you can just imagine Philip going, we got, some, we got some fish and some loaves. It's fine, you know. Maybe Peter over there going, yeah, with five, five loaves. It'll be, don't, don't worry. But this is the, the scene that they find themselves in. Jesus going and asking them to do something that probably isn't very comfortable, right? Jesus asks us to do stuff all the time that isn't comfortable, right? It's tough to do the things that the Lord wants us to do a lot of times. He doesn't put us in in easy situations. Even the disciples, when he sent them out two by two, they hadn't been doing that very long. And he's like, okay, you're good. Go on out. And he puts us in awkward situations sometimes to see what we're going to do, to see how we're going to handle it. This is probably a pretty awkward situation. I know you've been here for eight hours, for ten hours, listening to Jesus preach, but I just need you to sit down. Look, there's some nice grass here. Just go ahead and, and, and have a seat. 
a little, little crazy, but he gets them to sit down in, in, their, in their different groups, and Jesus had a plan. In verse 11, it says that Jesus gave thanks for the food. Something else that, you know, I have, I have difficulty with sometimes, thanking the Lord for what I have instead of telling the Lord what I don't have, right? He only had five loaves and two fish. It wasn't, wasn't much, but he thanked the Lord for it. He thanked God for the provisions that he had there. Seems a little crazy to us in human speaking, right? Okay, I got to feed all these people and all I got is this little bit of food. Thank you. But that's the way we need to be, right? We need to have that heart of gratitude for what we don't have. Because it's easy to list the things we don't have, right? We don't have a big enough house. We don't have a nice enough car. We don't have a boat. We don't have a, you know, go on down the list. Like the ability to speak even, you know, we, 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 I just, there's no way I could do that. I couldn't tell someone about Jesus because I'm too shy. You know, we can tell the Lord, we can list all the things in our lives that we don't have, but the Lord isn't interested in what we don't have, right? He knows what we have and what we don't have. He's interested in what we have. And are we willing to bring that to him to see what he can do with it? And so the Lord had a plan. So he thanks, the, he thanks God. He, he asked the blessing for the food there. And then on to our next point. We see that the Lord has all power. Let's flip over to Matthew chapter 28. Keep your finger there and John will come back. But Matthew chapter 28. Another familiar passage. Verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now he goes on there and gives us the Great Commission and tells us what we're supposed to do to go preach, teach, baptize, you know, and all that. And, and, um, but really want to focus here on is Jesus saying, Look, all power. I have all power. And we see that here. We take for granted that the Lord that we serve has all the power. He has the vision. He knows what we need. He has a plan. And he has the power to, call, to, to make that plan happen. And we struggle in life a lot of times trusting that he really does have all power, right? We talked about a couple a week and a half ago when I, when I preached on prayer. We have trouble a lot of time believing that prayer works. We have a lot of time we say we do, right? We all know that we, but do we really act like we do? Do we live that life that, that we do have that faith? And um, that Jesus, God, has all the power. He can do what needs to be done. And we see that here. Back to the story, picture it. So the disciples, they've gone around to all these different people. Please sit down here. You sit down here. And they're walking back to Jesus, and he just blessed the food, and they're going, okay, well, maybe one trip? I don't know. This is going to be probably a little crazy of a day now so they go and they get their food they take it out to the first group and they're passing by the second group and they're going I probably won't be back I don't know we'll see you know it's a stressful weird situation right continuing to believe that the Lord has the power and the vision and the plan to take care of this situation that they're in and they're walking back and forth and I don't know how it happened you know, how the bread just kept multiplying itself. Uh, the, the scripture seems to kind of indicate that he just kept breaking it off. It kept coming off. I don't know. Any way you look at it, God has the power. Jesus had the power to make sure that there was going to be enough for everybody there. There was going to be enough. Kept breaking it off. And the disciples, they would come and 20,000 people, 17, whatever it is, a lot of thousands of people. Can you imagine 12 guys feeding them? This isn't something that happened quick. We read it quickly, but think about how crazy that must have been. Back and forth and back and forth and how awkward it was. And, you know, they, they had their little, you know, whatever they were carrying the food in back and forth. And we have trouble telling our neighbor 
Inviting our neighbor to church, <laughs> you know. We have, and, and, and all this, God has a plan, and God has the power, and we need to trust in that power. And we see, they just kept going back and forth, and finally, we see next that, number four, the Lord also gives abundantly, right? He saw the people. He had the vision of what they needed. He had a plan for those people. He had the power to pull it off. But not only did he have the power, but he gave abundantly. Let's flip over to Ephesians. Ephesians 3. <coughs> Excuse me. My mouth is never so dry as when I'm <laughs> up here. Ephesians 3, 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ask or even think to ask. That's the Lord that we serve. He has the power to give what we need and to give way more than what we could even think about needing. And that's where we see there in the rest of the passage where the disciples, they now, they fed everybody, everybody's full, and Jesus tells them, all right, now go pick up the leftovers. Also a little crazy, right? So now you got these 12 guys walking back and forth, going to all these people, okay, you got anything left? I need to, you know, you got anything? And can you imagine Philip and Andrew kind of going back and forth? Philip saying, Andrew, <laughs> remember that time that you said, but what are those amongst so many? <laughs> you know, you, you, well, you were talking about eight months worth of money wasn't even going to be enough to give them a little bit of food. You know, can you imagine the interaction of them that day? Talking to each other and just being amazed and dumbfounded. And then when they get all the food together, 12 baskets. So you think that over the next several days... Every time they had leftovers out of their basket, they kept going back to this, remembering Jesus' vision, Jesus' plan, Jesus' power, Jesus' abundance, and how that he can give what we need and so much more. And obviously this, this passage has a lot of applications to it. And we've covered uh, some of those here, obviously, already. But the, the, the question I really want to ask everyone here is, is let's flip over to Mark Real quick, Mark 6. Mark 6 and verse 38. He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. How many loaves have ye? I saw that on a billboard a few years ago. It said, How many loaves have ye? And it took me a minute, you know, really kind of thinking and contemplating about that and, and praying about that. And, and, you know, it's been something that I haven't forgot. How many loaves have ye? What do you have? That boy had five. And he gave them to the Lord. And thousands were taken care of. How many loaves do you have? What abilities do you have? What strengths do you have? What do you have in your life that God has given you that if you gave it back to him, how many people could be affected by it positively? How many loaves do you have? Like I said earlier, it's easy to list the things that we don't have. It's easy to list those things that we're lacking. But God's not interested. He doesn't say, hey... What don't you guys have, right? Because he knew, right? He knew that there wasn't a, you know, a restaurant down the street that could house all these people and could feed them quickly. 
Jesus knew what was going on. He didn't ask them what they didn't have. He didn't say, what do you lack? What, he said, or what do you need? He said, what do you have? Let me take what you have already and use it in a powerful and abundant way. God sees you, right? God knows who you are. God knows where you are in your life. He values you. He sees the value of, that you have. He has a plan for you. He has all the power to carry out that plan and give you more, even abundantly exceeding than we could ask or think. But we've got to be willing to bring what we have to God. Right? The first little thing that every person needs to do in their life, it's seemingly little, but it has big implications, is trust the Lord as their Savior. Let's turn to 2 Peter 3.9 real quick. Second Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants us all to come to repentance. He wants us all to understand that we are sinners in need of a Savior and that He has the power by sending His Son to die on the cross that our sins are covered and we ask Him into our heart, we believe on Him to be our personal. He can save us from eternal separation from the Lord. He will save us. No matter what we think we've done wrong, no matter what kind of uh, sin we have in our life, the Lord is all-powerful. He has all the power to do that. So that's the first thing that everyone needs to do. If you're not saved today, don't leave the door back there, I beg you, without realizing that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, knowing that Jesus can take care of that. And we're going to have an invitation in a few minutes, and if you need to come forward, we definitely would, would love to show you how to do that. And then if you are saved, what are the little things that you can do? What do you have? You know, monetarily, as a trustee, I think I have to say this. Uh, you know, giving the Lord what He has given you through your tithes and offerings, right? Supporting the church, supporting our pastors. That's what we're, we're that's part of our responsibility as a church, right? And there's nothing too little. God can take five loaves and feed thousands. Imagine what He can do with what you have. It, through service, right? Through our service, whether it's singing, Brother Mark doesn't want me up here singing, I promise you. But there are many here that I'm sure can sing. I know everyone in here can sit down with kids in Awana and listen to them and help them learn Bible verses. And there's a pretty good chance maybe you'll learn some yourself. Children's church. Nursery. I mean, there's a lot of things around here uh, that need to be done. That there are people here that have the knowledge and the ability, but are they willing to use what they have for the Lord? The Lord's given it to you. Are you ready to give it back to Him and see what He can do with it? The Bible says that we all, as Christians, have a spiritual gift, right? Let's turn it over to 1 Corinthians real quick, and then with this, well, I will close. 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, verse 7. <clears throat> but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then it goes down the list of spiritual gifts. So every man, every person, every man, woman, every Christian, is given a spiritual gift to profit everybody, right? But you have to be willing to use it for the Lord. Everyone has an ability. How many loaves do you have? And are you bringing it to the Lord for, and see what He can do with it? We'll have the musicians come. 
and we will have everyone stand and we are going to sing together I Surrender All page 451 in your hymnals there if you need those but I invite you to come <laughs> 